Uh, good morning. It's great to have you here with us this morning as we gather together to worship God and celebrate what He's done for us in, in Jesus. If you are visiting with us, if you're new here, my name is Tim and I'm the, the senior pastor here at Three Lake Evangelical Free Church. We're delighted to have you here with us this morning. Uh, just a couple of things to bring to your attention. One is that if you are new or visiting, there is a, a Connect card on the seat in front of you. We'd invite you to fill that out with any information you'd like to pass along to the church, whether that's your name, email address, any prayer requests you may have. And if you do fill that out, you can place those in the wooden boxes that are on the back wall. On your way out this morning, those wooden boxes are also where tithes and offering can be placed if you want to give to what we're doing here as a church. A couple of announcements to bring to your attention. One is that we're getting ready for, for Sunday school in the fall. And so downstairs that you came in, you probably saw there's sign-up sheet for Sunday school. So if you have a child who will be participating in Sunday school this coming uh, school year, we invite you to sign up, sign up just so we have an idea of for, for numbers heading into the fall. Also we're looking for someone to teach third grade. And so if you're interested in helping serve by teaching our third graders, um, you can contact uh, Deb Canada, her contact information in the bulletin. Um, yeah, we invite you to do that as well. Um, so this morning we have Kent Cohn with us from Esther's House. He's going to come and just share a little bit about what Esther's House is and what they're doing uh, here in Three Lakes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Isn't it a great opportunity we have this morning to worship our Lord on such a beautiful day in the North Woods? So my name is Kent Cohen. I'm, with, I'm a director at Esther's House, and I want to talk a little bit about Esther's House. It's kind of important because uh, you may or may not know that Esther's House is, is going to be located right here in Three Lakes to begin with. So our first location is right here in Three Lakes. What is Esther's House? Esther's House is a ministry of Northwood Share, and Northwood Share it is an organization, an Eagle River-based uh, organization uh, supported by churches and community uh, groups, individuals. And what they do is it's a ministry uh, that serves the community through community dinners, through uh, something called the Needs Ministry, where people can come and get, each week, each Wednesday, they can come and get items for their home that they wouldn't normally be able to get at a food pantry. So paper products, uh, clothing, uh, soaps and detergents, things like that. We serve about 100 or 500 families and about 100 of those families are headed by single moms. So over the years we've seen that there's a need to serve the single mom uh, population that we have here, the ones that are somewhat in, in need. The mission of Esther's House is to bring um, a, a place where single moms with kids can uh, single moms with kids can come as they transition to more permanent housing. So if you have a, a Christ-centered program where they can live and also be mentored by Christian um, Christian moms, Christian uh, females, they can learn and they can uh, they can adjust to. Uh, the things that they're going to need to do to be more successful when they tra transition uh, to more permanent housing. So what I'm going to do this morning is just very briefly uh, answer questions. We aren't going to have time for a question and answer period. So I'm just going to skip to the questions that I typically get uh, to help clarify things after a presentation. Transitional living is not, it's not a sober house. Uh, we're going to be located right here in Three Lakes. Uh, we're partnering with the Union Congregational Church. Uh, the building is their former parsonage. We're not a temporary shelter. It's not that. It's not a crisis house where someone uh, needs a place for just a night or two. This is a permanent, uh, semi-permanent residence for the mom and her kids. We expect, we're based on the Hager House. For the most part, Hager House is a similar organization in Wausau. Their residents, their guests, stay uh, on average six to 18 months, on average 12 months. So we can expect that they're gonna be a part of the community, they're just not gonna be an overnight visitor, if you will. How big is the need? Uh, the need is somewhat surprising. We have uh, homeless teens 
I got interested in, in trying to help the homeless uh, here by encountering homeless teens in Eagle River. Uh, first a male and then a female. I happened to be talking to three uh, teenage girls and I brought up the point that I had seen this teenage boy, somebody they knew, they had graduated recently uh, in the park by himself, he's homeless, and I encountered him, just talked to him. And as I'm talking to them, it got quiet. There's only three girls sitting there. It got really quiet. One of them said, can we have uh, just a, they call it a tea time. It's a time where, I mean, you might be familiar with that term. Tea time is, is, is a term that uh, some of the teens have where whatever said at that moment doesn't get repeated anywhere with specifics. So in generalities, uh, one of the three was homeless. And so I, now this need is growing. So I went to my pastor at North Life Church, and he sent me to Northwood Share and then also to Sunshine for Humanity, which is another homeless shelter up the road. Well, anyway, long story short, we found out there was a huge need uh, through the schools and others for, to serve the single mom population. In the last five or six weeks, I've been contacted by 19 families. 14 of those are headed by single moms. All of them are homeless and all of them are right here. They're in the Eagle River area. Um, it's just a very sad kind of state of affairs. We're not gonna be able to help all of them. The reasons for homelessness are wide ranging. Um, the ones we're gonna be able to help are the ones that really want help. Um, they're gonna change. Um, they're gonna be open to the things that we're gonna suggest to them. Um, some of the things that, that I encountered here in the Tri-County area in the last year, 100 women have been rescued uh, from trafficking. It gives you an idea. Some of them are doing it to support their families. I talked to one woman who uh, went into that line of work um, to keep her teenage sister, to support her teenage sister. The mom and the dad are not present in the situation. The biggest myth about homeless people is that um, they don't work, they don't have cars, and they know how to cook. That might sound kind of interesting, but most homeless people are relying on fast food and microwave type things. Um, they do work, and they do have automobiles. Who's helping us with Esther's House? Right now, um, when we first started, it, it started kind of slow, and then we had people uh, coming to me from all sorts of professions and all sorts of backgrounds. I think there's 11 or churches represented. There's over 80 individuals. Some people right from here um, in your congregation are, are playing a big part in making Esther's House happen. How does Esther's House work? Some people are concerned that it's gonna be a handout situation. It's very much not. It's a program. We have an all-volunteer staff, so no one there is a paid employee. I'm not, I'm a director, but I'm not paid. I'm semi-retired, but I think I'm working more now than when I was, when I was being paid. There's no visitors allowed unless previously uh, agreed to. There's random drug and alcohol testing. Uh, we have weekly visits by staff. There's no pets there. There's mentoring by Christian women. Um, so there are going to be uh, women coming in and out of the house. Christian women, maybe some from even your congregation, are going to be going in and out. Um, teaching basic life skills. Um, how to deal with certain situations. How to find food. How to access health care. How to get the car repaired. Basic life skills. There are going to be contributions by the mom who's working toward her care. She's going to, 30% of her gross is going to go, gross income, is going to go toward the program. At the end, she's going to get 20% of that back. So even if she's working minimum wage and she's with us for a year, she's going to have five or $6,000 at the end of the year to help launch her to her more permanent um, housing situation. The other 10% goes towards um, program costs. If they're significant, think about um, what it costs to run your household and the, the costs involved in that, everything from uh, food to uh, utilities to extracurricular activities for the children. 
the whole idea of Esther's house is really based on something from long ago. If you, if you ever saw the wristband, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's the whole idea. So everything is going to be Christ-centered. Um, it's important to us to bring the gospel message um, to the families that will be living uh, in Esther's house. And we're hopeful that uh, as we go forward, uh, the Three Lakes Evangelical Free Church can be part of, of helping us. Um, it, I can maybe take one or two questions and then we're gonna get on with worshiping our Lord. Does anybody have a question? No questions, okay. The person that's moving into the home uh, is probably not, we're not gonna identify her by name. She may be in your church uh, actually in a week or two. So we're hoping that she's gonna pass the final um, questions and answers that we need to uh, ask in our application process. Thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm gonna be available after. Um, there is a summit of a green brochure that will be on the table in the back. I think some of you picked them up or were handed them on the way in. That'll give you a more clear understanding. Right now, if you're interested in helping us, it's time, talent, and treasures. If you can contribute any of those things, um, don't take any of your talents for granted. Uh, we may be able to use um, whatever you think you can bring to our, our efforts. So thanks again. Thank you, Kent. And I just encourage you to talk to him afterward and find out more about what it can look like to be involved with that ministry. We're going to transition now into our time of, of worship. And so as we do that, I'm just going to invite us into a time of silence where we can really focus our heart, focus our minds on what we have the privilege and the opportunity to do here as we gather. So would you join me now in a time of silence?
may be seated. <clears throat> Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Father, we come gathering before you today here in this place just in awe of who you are and your goodness and your worthiness of praise, of, of glory. And so we pray that as we worship you this morning, as we sing together, as we hear your word, as we fellowship together after the service, would it all serve to, to pour out praise and glory and honor to you. And Father, as we, as we walk through life, as we face, as we just sang ups and downs, challenges and, and blessings, would you... Would you be glorified? Would your name be blessed in all of it? Would we see your good hand even in the midst of life's challenges and trials? Father, would you be at work in each one of our hearts, each one of our lives to, to help us live constantly, day by day, moment by moment, in light of the reality of who you are? Would our knowledge of you be more than just mere intellectual knowledge, right? but it be a heartfelt relationship that, that causes us to live life in a way that brings you honor and glory. Father, we pray this morning for, for Esther's house and for the work that's being done there and continues to be done. Pray that you would provide for all the needs that Esther's house has. We pray for the family that will move in there, that you would work in mighty ways to bless that family and to reveal yourself ultimately through this whole program to, to draw that family either into a relationship with you or deeper into a relationship with you. Uh, we pray for those in our, our church family who are hurting, who are facing trials of, of various kinds that... And those who are walking through trials and difficulties would be able to rejoice in the midst of the suffering, knowing that you are a good and loving God. We pray for those who are hurting, who are sick, who are in need, that you would meet their needs according to your riches, according to your grace. And Father, as we continue to sing now, pray that the words that leave our mouths would not be just mere repetition based on what's on the screen, but they would be the heartfelt overflow of praise coming out of our hearts. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, it is indeed you who, who give us breath, and every breath we get is a gift from you until we use whatever breath you give us, whatever life you give us for your honor, for your glory. Would we not take it for granted? Would we not think it's ours? But would we receive it as a gift from you to be used for your glory? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Kids in 4K through 2nd grade are dismissed at the time to go to Children's Church if they want to do that. I thought I'd open this sermon by sharing a few facts about myself for, for reasons that will be obvious in a few moments. So here are the facts. Right? One is that I have a pretty significant fear of heights. Another is that I am not what you would call adventurous. Right? Like, like I'm generally pretty risk adverse. Like things like skydiving and whitewater rafting, even roller coasters, like they don't hold much appeal for me. I'm much more inclined to be home reading a book than I am to be out on some adventure doing something risky. And the third fact is that my upper body strength could generously be described as mediocre at best. I'm just not, not real strong, right? And so in light of those facts, there are few people that I know of that on earth that are more different from me than a guy named Alex Honnold. If you're not familiar with Honnold, he's a, he's a rock climber, so his upper body strength is vastly superior to mine. And he rose to fame upon the release of a documentary in 2018 called Free Solo. And Free Solo documented Honnold's quest to become the first person to ever free solo the famous El Capitan rock formation in Yosemite National Park. And so in the world of, of rock climbing, Free soloing refers to, to climbing a rock formation by yourself, so hence the solo, and with no ropes or safety equipment of any kind. So he's climbing that thing by himself with no rope, no safety equipment. And many sections of El Capitan are, are nearly vertical. There's almost no ledges or handholds to grab onto. And Honnold set out to climb it by himself with no ropes, no equipment. And there are shots in this, in this documentary that, that triggered my fear of height, or gave me a sense of vertigo. Right? Despite the fact that I'm like sitting on my couch, on the ground, like I know I'm there, and yet I'm feeling like the genuine terror at seeing him do these things. Right? Like, like, just look at that. Like, just, just look at that picture. Like, make me tremble a little bit. Right? Like, like the thought of climbing El Capitan is, is more than enough to instill fear in me. But El Capitan and, and the Yosemite Valley in general has the ability to instill another kind of fear as well. A kind of fear that's something closer to awe and wonder and, and reverence. So the naturalist John Muir spent much of his career living in and writing about Yosemite National Park and the Yosemite Valley, Valley. And in fact, one of the routes that people used to climb El Capitan is called the Muir Wall. And Mir once wrote of Yosemite, it is by far the grandest of all the special temples of nature I was ever permitted to enter. It must be the sanctum sanctorum of the Sierras. And I trust that all, you will be, all be led to it. He speaks of Yosemite in like, literally religious terms. Like he, he calls it the grandest of all the temples of nature. He even capitalizes the N in nature as a way of deifying it. He calls it the sanctum sanctorum, like literally the holy of holies of the Sierras. He gave it these religious overtones. Hanel said something similar when he says this, I'm very anti-religion. I think it's just all medieval superstition. So you get another way word, very different. But he says that religion relies on some desire for spiritual connection and I do get that just from being out in Yosemite. I get that feeling of grandeur and awe in the world, sitting on a cliff at sunset, watching the mountains glow pink, that a lot of people get through religious faith. 
And I share all this because this morning we, we come to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. We're in, this is week 15 of going through the book of Ecclesiastes. We're at the very end. Now we're going to look at verses 8 through 14 of chapter 12. And we'll look at all, all those verses, but we're going to focus in on verse 13, which is one of the more well-known verses in the book. Right? Verse 13 says this, Having heard everything, I have reached this conclusion. Fear God and keep His commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. And I think if we're going to properly understand this verse, we need to know what the author means by fear. And often when we talk about fear, just in our normal language, when we think about fear, it's something close to the feeling I would have trying to climb El Capitan. The typical way we talk about fear in our world is talk about being scared or afraid or terrified. And the Bible certainly uses the word fear that way sometimes. But sometimes, and including in, in this case, the Bible uses fear in a slightly different way. And the, the idea behind fear here in this verse and often throughout the Bible is closer to what Mir and Hanel described when they talked about being out in Yosemite. Hanel talked about the feeling of, of grandeur and awe. Mir calls Yosemite a special temple at the, the Sanctum Sanctorum, the Holy of Holies, the place where we are drawn to worship. And in this sense, like the word fear in the Bible means something closer to, to reverence or respect or awe. So it's an awe of God, a respect of God, a, a reverence for a God that is the whole duty of man. And it's not surprising right, that, that Mir and Hanel both would find a sense of wonder in nature. Both of men rejected traditional religion, certainly were not Orthodox Christians, and so they had to find that sense somewhere. Paul Tripp in his book, Awe, which is all about this feeling of, of respect and reverence and fear of God, says this, We are made for awe. Our hearts are always captured by something. That means we are always living in pursuit of something. When awe of God doesn't rule your heart, you will look for fulfillment where it can't be found. And that's so much of what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. It's the futility of life, the, the vanity of life, the meaningless of life, when we look for meaning where it can't be found. The other famous line in Ecclesiastes is the refrain that found in the first verse of our passage today. Chapter 8, verse 12 says, Absolutely futile, or lament the teacher. All of these things are futile. Right? Depending on your background, your upbringing, you may know this passage is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Or, or meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. But no matter how you translate it, right, what this refrain is driving at is what Tripp is describing in the quote I just read. When awe of God doesn't rule your heart, you will look for fulfillment where it can't be found. When, when awe of God doesn't rule your heart, you will be left with this sense that everything is futile or, or vain or meaningless. If you've been here often throughout this series, you're, you're probably tired of me talking about it. But the word that translated futile or vanity or, or meaninglessness is the Hebrew word chabel. And I've said it endlessly, but this is a hard word to translate, which is one English word. And so throughout the series, I've, I've tried to capture this word in all its nuance and, and different sermons. We don't have time to go into the whole depth of meaning this morning. But the, the short version is this, right, that chabel speaks of really the insubstantiality of life, right? That life is short, it's a, it's a breath, it's a vapor. Think of how life is beyond our control. Like trying to control life is like trying to grab an armload of smoke and move it where you want to go. It doesn't work. Life is hollow. It can't bear the full weight of our expectations. Life doesn't, can't give us everything we hoped it would give us. And what I hope we see this morning, if that's the case, if life really is chabel, if life is beyond our control and unable to bear our expectations, 
then our response to the chabelness of life is to fear God and keep His commandments. So as we jump in this morning, we're going to read this whole passage together. And I already kind of gave you a, a peek into what we're going to focus on, which is that we're going to t- focus on fearing God and keeping His commandments. And so in light of that, it's kind of a, a tangible expression of our, our reverent respect and fear of God. I'd invite you to, to stand as we, we read this passage together. If you're willing and able, how would you make sure to stand? Starting in verse 8, chapter 12, Ecclesiastes says this, Absolutely futile, laments the teacher, all these things are futile. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also taught knowledge to his people. He carefully evaluated and arranged many proverbs. The teacher sought to find delightful word and to write accurately truthful sayings. The words of the sages are like prods, and the collected sayings are like firmly fixed nails. They are given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition, in addition to them. There is no end to the making of books, and much study is exhausting to the body. Having heard everything, I have reached this conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. For God will evaluate every deed, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. You may be seated. The first thing I want to see in the passage is right, the, the habelness, for lack of a better word, of life. And this is the sense we've already talked about that when we look for, for satisfaction and fulfillment in life, we often look at areas where it can't be found. We look for fulfillment in life through things like work success or financial security or the acquisition of material possessions or the success of our favorite sports teams or romantic conquest or family or, or natural beauty like Mir and Hanel. We, we look for fulfillment where it ultimately can't be found. All the things are good in and of themselves, when we look to them at the ultimate meaning and purpose in life, we will be disappointed. But we're all prone, we're all wired to look for fulfillment and meaning and satisfaction somewhere. In 2005, David Foster Wallach gave a, a now famous commencement address at Kenyon College. In fact, Time Magazine named this the best commencement address ever. And this address is probably best known for its, its opening line, in which Foster says this. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what is water? And that story is often used to demonstrate how we aren't often consciously aware of the, of the cultural soup we're swimming in. But that's an astute observation that we just often don't realize like, what's going on in Radhika. It's so natural to us. But later in that same speech, Wallace makes a, another observation that is, to me at least, even more astute. And Wallace was not a religious man. He was certainly not anything we'd call, anything we'd be described as orthodox Christianity. And yet he said this. Here's something else that's weird but true. In life, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before your loved ones finally plant you. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, 
always on the verge of being found out. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship that they are not that they are evil or sinful, that they are unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. And the so-called real world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings because the so-called real world of men and money and power hums merrily along in a pool of fear and anger and frustration and craving and worship of self. And I know that's a long quote, but I don't know a better description of life's habelness than that. That quote feels like something the teacher of Ecclesiastes would have written if he showed up today and updated this book for a modern audience. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. Nothing else will satisfy. That's Chabel. And Foster is right when he says that the insidious thing about all these other forms of worship is not that they're sinful or evil, but that they're unconscious. That they're default settings. That the world will do nothing to persuade us to not worship those things because the world runs well in a pool of fear and anger and frustration and craving and worship of self. Which is why life can feel so habel, so hollow, so empty, so futile and meaningless. We are made to worship. We're made to feel awe. But our default setting is to worship created things rather than the Creator. Because we're born into sin, we, we sinfully want to worship other things rather than God Himself. And the worship of the things of this world rather than God leaves us feeling eaten alive because nothing else can satisfy. Which then leads us to the famous verse we talked about earlier, verse 13. Having heard everything in light of all that talk about Chabel, I have reached this conclusion. Fear God and keep His commandments because this is the whole duty of man. And just sit with that verse for a second. This is the whole duty of man, of mankind. This is what life is about. And this is not a little part of life. This is not one area that should be factored into your life equation. This is the whole duty of man. Fear God, keep his commandments. Life should be centered on those two things, fearing God and keeping commandments. In other words, our, our life should be about like, having a heart and a mind and a soul that has a disposition that's centered on knowing and relating to God, fearing God. Right? Our heart should be centered on knowing God, being in awe of God. And then we should be concerned with living an outward life that obeys the commands of God. Right? Those two things, uh, inward disposition, disposition focused on knowing and loving and cherishing and reverencing and, and fearing God and an outward disposition of obeying God's commandments. Like those are the two things that matter. That's the whole duty of mankind. And we see those two things go hand in hand often in the Bible. Think of what Jesus tells us the two greatest commandments are. Love God. Right? So have a heart of inward disposition of, of loving God. That's commandment one. That's the greatest commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's the tangible, outward working of the love of God. It's keeping God's commandments. Those two things go hand in hand. Love God. Love your neighbor. Or think of the Great Commission. Jesus tells his followers to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To command them to to draw their heart into faith, into love of God, into fear of God. But it doesn't stop there, he says. And also, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. 
Teach them to also work out their faith with outward, tangible expressions of obedience. I think of Paul and James in the New Testament who are kind of battling opposite sides of the same coin. Paul is often dealing with religious people who pointed to their good work as the reason for their salvation. And Paul point to them with, hey, you actually don't fear God. You don't know God. You don't trust Jesus. That's your good works by themselves are not enough. But James, on their hand, was dealing with those who, who claimed to have faith, but who didn't keep God's commands. And to them he said, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claimed to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is not accompanied, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And so the whole duty of man, the key to joy and, and satisfaction and, and fulfillment in a world of habel, it's fearing God and keeping His commandments. We need both. We need this reverent awe and respect of God. We need a, a heart that's tuned to, to love and trust God. And we need a life that's marked by the outward keeping of His commandments. Now, the rest of our time together, I just want to touch and talk a little bit about how we cultivate each of those in our lives. How do we cultivate a fear of God? And how do we cultivate a life that's marked by keeping his commandments. I'm going to start with fear of God. And our, our lives should be marked by a, a consistent and, and ongoing and continual disposition of having a, a reverent respect and awe of God. We should constantly be marveling at who God is. We should continually be astounded by who God is and what God has done and is doing for us. We should never stop sensing at a deep heart level that, that God is awesome, right? in, the, in the original sense of that word. That He is worthy of our awe. Again, Paul David Tripp in his book Awe says this, You will never understand what you were made to be and what you were made to do until you understand that you were made to live in a real, heart-gripping, agenda-setting, behavior-forming awe of God. We were not made right, to live with some simple, low-level background knowledge that, yeah, God is real and I know I need Jesus, but then to go on with our lives as we see fit. We were made to live with a real, heart-gripping, agenda-setting, behavior-forming awe of God. We were made to, to fear God, to revere God, to stand in awe of God daily, consistently, moment by moment. This holy awe of God, this fear of God, should inform everything about our lives. But often our kind of relationship with God is it's nothing more than mere intellectual assent. At least I know that's the case for me. That so often, like, that my default setting as I go about day to day is, yeah, I know God exists, and yes, I know Jesus is God's Son, and that He died for my sins, but now I'm going to go on with my life and do what I need to do, and He's kind of operating in the background, but not really the tangible forefront of my thoughts. Often, if we're honest, our intellectual assent to the existence of God does little to really grip our hearts and set our agendas and form our behaviors. Maybe that's you this morning. That you know God exists. You find yourself in this place where you have a knowledge of God. You confess that, yes, God is real. You confess that you need Jesus. You call yourself a follower of Jesus. But also, if you're honest with yourself, if you look at your your day to day life, the reality is that your your day to day life is not truly informed by by living in this awe and fear and reverent respect of God. 
Maybe the, the day-to-day reality of who God is doesn't really have much of an impact on how you live out your life day-to-day. So the question is then, if, if our whole duty is to fear God and keep the commandments, then how can I move from a mere intellectual ascent of God to this heart-gripping awe of God? How can I grow in my fear of God? And I would suggest if you want to move from just knowing God in the background of your life to having it inform everything about your life, if you want to move into a life that's marked by true, genuine awe and reverence and fear of God, if you want to fellowship with God that in a way that, that truly transforms and informs every moment of your day, day by day, minute by minute, second by second, if you want that kind of fellowship with God, if you want to grow in that kind of fear of God, then I would suggest that one of the places to start is by developing practices and habits and rhythm that your life is framed around. Our practices, our, our habits, our rhythms, our, our disciplines have this profound ability to, to form and shape our heart affections. I fear sometimes we've bought into this lie right, that our practices only ever flow out of our heart affections and not the other way around. Right? We see it as a, as a one-way street. We say, like, I love Jesus, so I'm going to pray. I love Jesus, so I'm going to read my Bible. And that's certainly true. The traffic does flow that way. But it also flows the other direction. It's a two-way street, not a one-way street. Our practices also shape our heart's affections. In the Sermon on the Mount, after talking about giving generously to those in need, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a practice, right, of storing up treasures in heaven shapes the heart. It goes both ways. The, the practice of generosity, the practice of stirring up treasure in heaven actually informs and changes and shapes the heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Often we think the only reality is, wherever my heart is, that's where my money will go, but it goes both ways. So if your heart feels a little dull to God, if you're living knowing God, but with your, all your heart having this reverent fear and awe of God, then right, the solution is not just to sit around waiting for God to change your heart, hoping for the best. The solution is to engage and practice it, that, that shape your heart to fear God. Not just maybe, oh, I'll read my Bible here and there when I have a few spare minutes. If that's what you're doing that now, that, that's better than nothing. Right? It's good to read God's Word. But I suggest that if you really want to live in this state of awe and grow in this state of awe and fear and reverence of God, then you need to structure your life around these disciplines, these practices, and not the other way around. You need to build a framework for your life that starts with God and then build the rest of your life around that rather than letting God sneak into your life whenever you have a few spare minutes. Your relationship with God and your your fear of God, your awe of God has to come first. And the rest of your life should be built on top of that because this is the whole duty of man. In order to build that kind of life, I would suggest that there are really four practices that we see throughout the Bible that are helpful in shaping our heart to have the kind of fear of God. Four practices that we see commended to us that ought to be the kind of bedrock foundation for our lives. And the first of those is, is Bible reading, like to, to read God's Word, to read the Scriptures, and be formed by them. I just encourage you to have a plan, have a, a structure in place where day by day you have a set time where you come to God's Word, 
and you open God's Word, and you see what God has to say in His Word to your life, that you let reading God's Word form this fear in you, that you have a plan for making your way through, through different parts of God's Word. Right? Maybe that's reading the whole thing in a year. Maybe that feels too ambitious for you, and that's fine, but that you have a plan to, to read through different books. You have a plan to read through different types of books, different genres, and like you are making your way through God's Word and letting it form this fear in you. Maybe it's listening instead of reading, but you're intaking God's Word in some capacity. You're saying, I'm going to daily come to the Word of God. I'm going to let God's Word be the bedrock, the first place that I start my life. I'm going to hear from God. And then in hearing from God, I'm going to let that be the foundation, the foundational reality for all of life. And I'll let this word form the fear of God in me. And then having heard from God, I'm going to respond to God in various ways, which leads to the second practice that I would commend, which is prayer. Like in, in prayer, you say, I'm going, to, I'm going to pour out my heart to God. Whatever junk is in there, whatever desires are in there, whatever requests are in there, I'm going to lay it all before God. Because God already knows my heart. There's nothing I'm going to hide from him because I can't hide anything from him. He knows everything. Part of what it means to fear God is to acknowledge that he knows you already, so there's nothing to hide. I'm going to lay it before him. I'm going to ask him for things. I'm going to rejoice in things. I'm going to praise him for things. But I'm going to engage with my Father in prayer. And I'm going to let the reality of who he is move me to pray. I'm going to let that prayer, again, form and deepen my, my fear and respect and awe of God. I'm going to let my, my praying move my heart to deepen my awe of God. That's the second practice. Bible reading, prayer, the third practice that we've talked about in the past of the church is the practice of, of fasting. And this often goes hand in hand with prayer, but... It's this idea that there are seasons of life, maybe a certain day in the week or a certain day in the month where I'm going to let my hunger, right, my, my physical hunger that I experience by not eating draw me ever closer to the Father. Fasting the way of acknowledging that, yeah, like there are some times I know in myself that it's easy to get carried away with my own life, my own concerns, and my own stuff. My mind wanders and I don't think about God enough. I don't Folks, I'm not fearing and reverencing and staying in awe of God. And so in a fasting, we let that, that physical hunger that we feel as we fast draw us back, draw our mind back to God. Like hunger shifts as a prompt, as a go that, that points our mind back to God and, and deepens this fear of Him. It's a physical, tangible reminder that we should be centered on God, that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. So in fact, we train our minds to, to be focused on and to build this reverent fear of God within us. And then finally, the fourth practice that this, the build, the kind of reverence for God is, is another practice we've talked about at the church, that's the practice of, of Sabbath. And in Sabbath, we set apart a day of the week for, for rest and for being intentionally focused on and remembering God and the, the good things He gives us. We remember all that God has done for us. Remember all that He is worthy of praise for, all the reasons He is worthy of respect. We again train our minds to, to deepen our awe of God through doing this. We set aside time. So I'd urge you to, to give a day of the week to, to Sabbath, to, to resting, to giving yourself freedom and permission to rejoice in and marvel at and stand in awe of all the good things God has done for you, to rest in His goodness, and thereby be led into a deeper reverence of God. If we do those, if we commit ourselves to structuring our life around practices of Sabbath and, and fasting and prayer and daily scripture reading, if we commit to making those practices the foundational framework of our lives, then the fear of God will, will be easier to cultivate in us. But when we try to live our lives on our own agenda or on the world's agenda, 
We just try to, to squeeze God in. We try to squeeze prayer in when it fits. We try to squeeze Bible reading in when it fits. And maybe we'll try to squeeze the Sabbath in here and there. When we let the world's agenda dictate our relationship with God, then it becomes awfully hard to, to cultivate this fear of God. So I just urge you right, to, to make the sacrifices needed. Maybe it means like, radically reorienting your life to make space for these practices, these rhythms. Right, but if you want to truly move, if you find yourself frustrated by being stuck in this place of having a knowledge of God, but not the deep fear of God, if you're frustrated by that, then I'd suggest that these practices can help move you along. These practices are, are helpful. They, they form this fear in us. Prayer, Bible reading, fasting, Sabbath, they're all practices that help cultivate the fear of God. I kind of didn't leave much time to talk about the last point here, which is keeping a commandment. So I'll just say this very quickly. If we cultivate the fear of God, if we live moment by moment in light of the awesome reality of who God is, then it will radically impact how we live our lives and how we engage with the world around us. We will naturally keep God's commands if we have this fear of God formed in us. If I live with a reverent fear of God, and it will spur me to seek justice. It will spur me to be generous with my time and my money. It will motivate me to be hospitable to others. It will cause me to want to spend time in community with fellow believers. It will cause me to seek to build relationships with unbelievers and invite them to know Jesus. And a heart-gripping, agenda-setting, behavior-forming awe of God will cause us to keep God's commandments. So the very last verse of this book, then. If you need any additional motivation for any of this, verse 14 says this, For God will evaluate every deed, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. That should be sobering. If you believe that, and it's in God's word, we should believe that. If you believe that, then that should cause fear of God to well in us, that God will evaluate every deed. I know some of my deeds. I know my secret thoughts and actions. Having God evaluate them is a, a scary, fearful thing. Because none of us is perfect. And God is perfect. He is holy. He is set apart. And so it stills fear in us. To why Jesus ultimately is so important. That Jesus came for all the times that we don't fear God as we ought for all the times we don't keep God's commandments as we ought to. Jesus came and He perfectly feared God. He perfectly kept every commandment of God. And by doing so, He offered Himself on the cross to, to die in our place for our sins so that by believing in Him, God sees us that if we did perfectly fear Him, perfectly keep His commandments every moment of every day, to for the times we fail to to acknowledge God and to revere God daily. The time we fail to keep God's commandments, we can be confident if we've trusted in Jesus that everything's been taken care of. And that can free us then to recommit ourselves to fearing God and keeping His commandments. And so if you've never trusted Jesus, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many practices you keep, no matter how many rhythms you fall into, no matter how many habits you form. You'll never perfectly obey God's commandments. And you need Jesus. I'd urge you, if you've never trusted Jesus, to do that. And for us who have trusted Jesus, we find great freedom in the fact that He did it for us. Not freedom to go live our lives however we want, but freedom in knowing that we don't have to be perfect because He's the perfect for us. And so when we fail, and we will fail, when we fail, we can get back on the horse, as it were, and 
commit ourselves to fearing God and keeping His commandments. And God will evaluate every deed. So when He looks at us, when He evaluates the deeds of Jesus and not my own, that's what faith in Jesus gives us. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we often worship and fear and revere things other than you. That we worship money, we worship ourselves, we worship security, we worship other things more than you when our lives show that we worship other things rather than you. Father, we confess and we pray this morning that you would help us to to fear you, to worship you. Would you prompt us and help us to, to form these habits and disciplines that form a, a fear of you in our hearts? Would you grow a reverent awe of you in our hearts? Would we live lives that are known and seen as keeping your commandments? Would we be seen by those around us and by the watching world as as holy and righteous and those who seek justice and mercy? Would we be seen by those around us as those who are generous and loving others and caring for the needy? God, would you instill within us a sense of the weight of the reality that our whole duty is to fear you and keep your commandments. And when we go living, seeking to do those two things. Praise God in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you go, would you go fearing God, keeping your commandments? You are dismissed. Blessed be the name